great. Oh, uh, so no, let's start the seminar for this week. So uh, today, Robin Sanderson is visiting from uh, Columbia. And where are you? Okay. Yeah, so I'm like to secondarily affiliated with them right really. now. Right. Well, it's going to change. It. Okay, yeah, so she's on all the York astronomy uh, at this moment. Um, so, uh, okay, so Robin got her PhD from MIT with Ed Bershinger, um, and uh, she moved to Gronin. Gronin? Gronin. I never know how to pronounce that. Gronin. 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 Uh, it, uh, to work with Amina Helming, uh, as you know, her first postdoc for a few years. And uh, so then she moved back here to the uh, uh, US. And then she's an NSF fellow, actually, uh, at uh, Columbia. So she's in a third year of that. And uh, she's um, going to talk about uh, uh, weighing and measuring galaxies. She has lots of interests in Milky Way science, uh, galactic dynamics, lots of connections with lots of the observations. So if you're interested in speaking with her, I encourage you to do that. She'll be here today and tomorrow. Yeah, we have two more days after this, so it's not, not a, an emergency. Thanks. Uh, okay, so, so today I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways that you can measure the, the dark matter distributions in galaxies. Um, and we're going to sort of progressively um, zoom in from large scales to small scales over the course of the talk. But first you might want to know why we care. Um, so uh, Lambda CDM, which is the standard model of cold dark matter with dark energy has been very successful in making a lot of testable predictions for what the structure of dark matter is on all scales. And it does better at agreeing with observations on some scales than on others, as you probably know. Um, but if you look at sort of the galaxy scale dark matter distribution, um, if you take sort of the initial conditions from CMB and put them into a cold dark matter simulation, then over time with gravity, you get out some prediction for what the dark matter should be. Um, and this is from the Millennium Simulation, this one. Um, and so that predicts sort of the amount and the shape of the dark matter in the halo of, of a given galaxy. Um, it also, as you can see from this image, predicts that there should be lots of substructures uh, in the dark matter at different scales. And this is one place where we have very few observational constraints. Um, and then it, it generically predicts that galaxies build up mass over time by accreting smaller structures onto themselves in addition to sort of smooth mode accretion. Um, and so, so the, these are all predictions for what the dark matter is doing, but in order to test them against observations, we have to somehow translate them into things that we can observe. Um, and until recently, one of the ways that you did this on the scales of galaxies and below was to essentially use a semi analytic model to tag some of the dark matter particles in one of these high resolution cosmological simulations as stars. Um, and if you do that, you can get a view not of what the dark matter halo of a galaxy looks like, but of the stellar halo of a galaxy. And the stellar halo is a part of the galaxy in a, in a generic galaxy where we have some visible tracers that are stars and satellite galaxies and stuff. Um, but, but you're far removed from where the disk would be, which is way down inside these little blobs in this, in this image. It's where the disk scales would be. And so that's, uh, that's helpful from an idea of like exploring where the dark matter is just because you are less uh, susceptible to what the baryons are doing. And when you don't put them in the simulation, you have a hard time getting the answer to agree with what you have if you're looking at regions where baryons are a dominant uh, influence. So if you, if you do this whole stellar tagging process, this, is, this movie is an example of that done with a higher version, a higher resolution version of the simulation I just showed you. So all these little blobs are now the tagged dark matter that is supposed to be stars. Uh, according to the semi-analytic model. And the different colors are different building blocks, right? So this central thing is going to be the, eventually the mass of the Milky Way. And you can see that over time, lots of different stuff comes in and accretes on and gets tidally disrupted and forms a bunch of tidal streams. And so handily, since it's a simulation, you can tell which stuff came from which progenitor just by looking at the colors. Of course, that's not true in real life, and that's something that will be a theme of this talk is how we untangle all of this in the end. Um, and so again, the, the stellar halo in, in simulations and also in reality extends far beyond the region where this is. Um, and so these tracers are really valuable to give us information about dark matter in a regime where it's not as heavily influenced by baryons and also where we don't have a lot of different tracers. Um, so lest you not believe me, there, here's a picture of a real stellar halo. This is a spectacular one. This is an elliptical galaxy. Um, and here's the stellar halo of our own galaxy in the famous field of streams. This is the northern sky. You can see that there are plenty of substructures here of various types. 
So, so what can we do with this? So these tidal streams give us a handle on the, on the mass profiles of galaxies in a couple of ways. The first one I'm going to talk about is how you can use some very symmetric interactions to estimate the masses and mass profiles of external galaxies. Um, and then the second is how you can untangle all of these different building blocks, uh, one from the other, as a, as a part of understanding better the dark matter distribution of the Milky Way. And then if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about a project that's almost finished, um, about how you can be sensitive with these tidal streams to uh, structures beyond, like below the scale of uh, a single galaxy, to look for some of the smaller scale substructure that, that is thought to be in the halos of Milky Way-sized galaxies. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is a project that goes all the way back to my thesis. Um, and it, it pertains to the kinds of structures you see here that have these really sharp edges and sort of a round looking. This is what you call a tidal shell. Um, and so the, the literature to these goes back to like the 80s when they discovered how to do unsharp masking to, to reveal uh, jumps in the surface brightness of, uh, of images. Um, and you see them around ellipticals like that one and also around spirals, this is the famous umbrella galaxy. Um, and these things are the products of encounters between a, a large galaxy and a, and a satellite galaxy on a really radial orbit. Um, and so you, this is an example here, a uh, very simple example actually. And you can see that what happens is as this thing gets disrupted by the tides, the, the stuff piles up at the center and creates a shell. Um, and in this movie, the, the satellite galaxy doesn't get completely tidally destroyed right away. Um, and so each paracenter passage that strips off more material from the dwarf ends up creating its own series of shells. Um, so you can see here there's actually a couple of series. Um, and so the advantage to, to looking at this kind of tidal structure is, is, is in the fact that the interaction is almost completely symmetric. So the, the motion is almost entirely along the radial direction and, and in the radial velocity with respect to the galaxy. And if you look in this phase space, you see a, a much simpler picture of what's going on. So here's the, the radius from the center of the host galaxy, and here's the radial velocity, which is in the same direction. This is falling in, this is coming out. And you can see that, first of all, as the material comes off of the progenitor satellite galaxy, it forms this very thin stream. Um, and that's because the mass of this thing is very small compared to the mass of the host. So you get a very cold set of test particles that all originated on similar orbits, just like with any tidal stream. And then you see that this stream sort of winds up and winds around in this, in this projection of phase space, and every time it bends around in here is where you get a shell. So, so you can see that in this, uh, in this projection, there's almost nothing going on outside of this projection of phase space for these interactions because they're so radial. Um, and, and near the shell, each of these has a pretty simple structure. It's almost like a line, but with a little bit of thickness that has to do with the velocity dispersion of the thing that's created it. Um, and so you can develop, in that case, a, an analytic model for what these should look like um, instead of having to create a bunch of embodied simulations to try to, to try to match what you see. Um, because basically, near the, the shell radius, which is this, um, this thing is just like parabolic. And it's got some thickness, which I call delta R, that just <coughs> like is proportional to the mass of the thing that fell in. Um, in some way that's a little bit more complicated than I'm just saying. Um, and you can also notice that the infall velocity at the shell is not zero as you would expect for stuff that's turning around at, at epicenter, right? So an individual star, when it gets epicenter, its radial velocity is zero, and then it changes direction, comes back in. Um, but you're looking at an ensemble of particles that are all on neighboring orbits, and so the, what that does, uh, since they don't all have the same exact velocity to begin with, um, or the same exact energy to begin with, is it creates an overlap of orbits that creates a caustic that it gradually moves outward um, as the stuff that's passing through it at the time uh, has successively is successively less bound, right? So that's why that's why this is not a zero like you would expect for a single orbit. Um, anyway, the 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 key here lies in the fact that the curvature of this like parabolic shape is proportional to one over the radial gravitational force that of the galaxy exerted on the tidal material at the shell. And so that's how you get to a mass estimate 
from an analyzing one of these shells with this model. Um, and so, so once you have this, right, you can you can take this analytic model where you just make a little Gaussian around this parabola, and you can project it using some assumptions about the geometry of the shell into whatever observational space you end up observing, right? So in, in practice, what you do is not observe the 3D radius and the 3D radial velocity, but the line of sight velocity and the and the projected radius on the sky of these things. Um, but since you have an analytical model, you can generate essentially a, a density distribution in that space and then see how you would observe it either with point tracers or with <coughs> integral field spectroscopy. So when you do that projection, you get something that looks like these red dots for a simulated shell, right? So you can see that the outer edge kind of traces this parabola that I was just showing you, but it's filled in now because you are taking dot products with your line of sight, which in this case is just is, is just oriented so that the, the shell has its maximum radius sort of at, a, at perpendicular to your line of sight. So this is sort of an optimal angle for observing these things. Um, but that, that can be a parameter of, of your model, right, is the way in which this thing is aligned. Um, and if you are, have enough tracers, in some sense, you can sort of find what the outer <coughs> edge of this thing is. And then you can fit the projected model, which is this pink line, and that should, one of the free parameters there is the, is the g-force at the, at the edge of the shell. So that gives you an estimate of the mass enclosed within the radius of the shell. And if you have more than one shell, you get an independent estimate at each radius where you have a shell and can do this analysis. And that brings you to like a, a coarse grain mass profile in, in principle. Um, so this green line here is, where, is based on one of the original papers that proposed doing this, which was by Mary Philip Koken. And they, they pointed out that if you have a zero energy spread initial distribution, that you'll just get a short line here um, and corresponding here. And so this little difference at the edge of the shell between this straight line and, this, and the model that I'm going to talk about is due to the fact that there's an, a spread in energies in the initial galaxy that creates the shell. Um, and so if you fit this slope, rather than allowing for that non-zero velocity, you tend to overestimate the mass by about a factor of three, is what it boils down to. So that's what's shown here. So these letter points are if you just fit a linear function, and the bigger ones are where we tried out this procedure on different simulations that are that it sort of agree less and less well with the assumptions that go into this model. Um, and so to the, the most relevant ones probably are these blue ones, which are based on a model of the M31 shell system. Um, and so that has like a realistic galactic potential in it with the disk and everything. And you still do a good job of, of estimating the mass in that case. These red ones that are doing really crappy are where I tried to break the, the model by, by using an extremely flattened uh, elliptical-like galaxy um, where, the, where the symmetry of the potential is really more cylindrical than it is spherical. Um, but you can relax this, this assumption of spherical symmetry by a, a, a significant degree before it becomes problematic in the model from our tests. All right, <coughs> so the other thing that you can do is you may have noticed, in, instead of like, it, well, for one, you're never gonna get this many point tracers in one shell. So you're never gonna see like this many things for which you have radial velocity. So that suggests that maybe what you should do is to look at these in integrated light. Um, and in fact, you can generate at some particular projected radius, what you expect the line of sight velocity profile to be using this model. Um, and that itself is sensitive to the mass at, at a single line of sight. So here's a picture of uh, the projected phase space density in the space of projected radius on the sky and line of sight velocity. And if you pick one radius and you look at what happens as you change the mass of the galaxy, you see that the profile changes. Um, and so ideally, if the model matched the data perfectly and you had enough, uh, and, you could, and you could get enough like spatial and velocity resolution, you could directly fit one of these models to the, to the line of sight velocity distribution that you get from the galaxy, and that should give you a mass. But it doesn't really work like that in principle because, the, because you haven't assumed anything about the way the stars are distributed along the phase space stream. Even. 
And that's not always the case even in the M-body simulations that I've been using to test this. Um, and so you can see here that there's sort of a variation. And I've picked out different projected radii and plotted the line of sight velocity distributions. And you can see that while they have some structure, it's not exactly what you expect from the model like I showed you before. As you, it changes as you go um, to different radii in the shell, but it also has a more complex structure. And that's because the material that's in a particular shell is not always evenly distributed in azimuth and all this stuff. Um, and you haven't accounted for variations along the stream and angular momentum, which can also mess you up when you get down to this level of, of precision. Um, but what you can do instead is you notice that, again, the overall width of the distribution <coughs> is changing. And it's governed by the same, it's, it's probing the same thing as the envelope of the projected phase space distribution. And so if you can measure the full width half max of your, of your line of sight velocity distribution, that should be enough to get you a mass estimate if you can measure it at enough different projected radii. Um, so here's an example where, for one of these line of sight velocity profiles, you can see that in most places you can get the model to match the data pretty well, but over here, like there's less material in the stream than in that part than you expected from simple assumptions. And so while these discrepancies come from the fact that I used one line of sight instead of integrating over this whole radial range, this one is not something that the model can handle very well. And so that's why you need to use the line of sight width instead. So, but if you do that, right, you're just measuring essentially these black points again, even though you're measuring them by integrating instead of by binning point, point measurements. And that gives you a mass estimate that's pretty close to what you would get um, to the input mass in this case. Um, so this is, this is stuff that I'm working on, on adapting for, um, for use with new IFU devices that are on different telescopes now because it's only in the last like couple of years that these that these kinds of observations have been possible given that these shells are such low surface brightness. Um, but but I'm working with a couple of different people to try to make this into a to try to flesh out what we have to do to make this a reality. Um, so so just to just to point out what's going on here, so these are these red points are the different full width half maxes. And the blue line is if I do a fit with three parameters, so you fit the expansion velocity of the shell, the radius of the shell, and the, and the mass. Um, and this is if you leave the mass fixed and fit the other two parameters. Um, and so you're not, you're doing like a factor of two or three, but for a lot of galaxies at these distances, there's not a lot, another way to get the mass, so at least you're doing better than nothing. Um, and I think that with a little bit more work we can do better than this. This was just a, a pilot example that I was trying to put together. All right, so, so the point here is that you can exploit the symmetry in these interactions to avoid having to do a lot of M-body simulations. And you can boil it down to essentially a three-parameter fit in order to get a mass estimate at each place where you have a shell if you can do the, uh, the observations that you need. Um, so what I didn't talk about, which I have tried, is that when you write down the projected phase space density, that's essentially a, a, a likelihood for point tracers being at certain points um, in, the, in the projected velocity distribution. So I've tried working with point tracer radial velocities, like from um, uh, globular clusters and planetary nebulae, and that it's very hard to get enough of them in one shell and be certain that they're in there. Um, to get a good constraint, which is why I think that IFUs are the way to go with this. Um, so really it's just like a problem with membership? So, so it's partly membership, but you can <coughs> take that into account if you, wanna, if you wanna put in a background model. And in a lot of cases, you kinda know what the background distribution is gonna be because you have some sense of what the velocity dispersion of the galaxy is. Yeah. So you can involve the outliers, but that again, but you're talking like five or six tracers in one shell, which is really not enough to adequately sample the phase space. Um, to do a good job constraining the mass um, is what I've been finding. So, so the outliers are somewhat of a problem because they decrease your power if you decide that one of your points is an outlier, but you have so few to begin with that that's really what the limiting factor has been in the analysis I've been trying to do, which is with the umbrella galaxy. Um, and so that's why I think that 
when you when you use an IFU, you're you're really like evenly sampling all of the face space that's lit up in the shell, and so that helps a lot in terms of in, in terms of making sure that you that you don't have these kind of membership problems. All right, so let's let's zoom in a little bit and talk about our, our own galaxy, which has its own stellar halo, and there we can get a really close up view. Um, and so not only is and, in, and since in our galaxy we have all these different tidal streams, which I showed you pictures of before, um, we can start to untangle them to try to figure out like what the accretion history of the Milky Way was. At the same, but in order to do that, we need to know what the potential is pretty well, um, and and that's not known very well at the moment. Um, so, so in fact, we kind of disagree to a level of a factor two on what the total mass of the Milky Way is, and there are a few constraints on its shape and scale radius, but they tend to be very model dependent. Um, so this is two examples of work that has tried to constrain the total mass. Um, and they both use tracers where they presume that they're in equilibrium and do <coughs> means analysis. So this is not, they're, they're assuming that none of these tracers are in streams. Um, so this one used stars and this one used satellite galaxies. And you can see that, um, so this one has these large contours. If you look at at the different lines on this plot, you'll see that having objects at larger distances helps you do a better job, which is kind of what you'd expect, um, since you're extrapolating from the region where you have data out to the imperial radius. Um, but then also, this, this one gets a, a tighter constraint, also partially because they try to fold in proper motion information where it, where it exists. Um, and so, so one of the assumptions that people make here that I think for the single stars, especially as you go out to larger distances, is going to be problematic is that they assume that everything is in equilibrium, where really you can look at the stellar halo of the Milky Way and see that there are significant parts of it that are clearly not in virial equilibrium, right? None of the streams are in are virialized in, in terms of their, and, and in fact as you go farther out, the, the dynamical time scales get so long that you, you don't have enough time in the universe to really wait for these things to have filled their orbital tori or get gotten fully mixed up um, and, and fit this assumption of equilibrium. So, but you can use them instead, just like we were doing in external galaxies. Uh, since all of the stars in each of these streams came from essentially a small distribution, um, and then they just behave like test particles after they're orbiting in the halo. Um, so you, you can use that instead as your fundamental assumption. Um, and people have done this with individual streams. Here's an example of uh, work from the group I used to be in in Groningen. Um, and this group earlier had done a similar fit. Both groups used a triaxial dark matter halo, but they made different assumptions about the way that the shape changed as a function of radius and got two different answers for what the potential should be. And that's mostly a function of having only used one stream, which only probes one set of orbits and therefore is only sensitive to like one combination of the different parameters in your model. Um, the, other, the other thing that, that could be causing part of this model dependence is that if you look here, here's the line of sight velocity versus one of the on-sky positions. Here's the other on-sky position. Here's the distance. So you're missing two of the six phase space coordinates that you have. You're missing two velocities. And the distance measurements are, are not as many as you might expect. Um, and so, so there's an information limiting problem currently, and there's a, and there's a, you know, how many streams do you need in order to agree on a potential kind of issue that's going on here. Um, so, so Gaia is going to solve a lot of the information problem within the next couple of years. So this is an astrometric survey satellite that was launched in 2013 by ESA, and it's going to observe astrometrically every star in the sky brighter than 20th magnitude. Um, it'll get proper motions and, and accurate positions and distances by parallax for all of those stars. And there's a radial velocity spectrograph on there that will go down to 16th magnitude and get RVs as well. So for, for about uh, 150 million stars, you will have complete phase space information. So, so this lack of velocity measurements is no longer going to be an issue for stars and guides for the view. So that's really exciting. Um, just for comparison, the current state of the art is probably Hipparchos, which only goes out to about 10 kpc, has about 100,000 stars in it, and the positions and proper motions that it got were three orders of magnitude less accurate than what guy will get. 
Um, so for for a hundred or ten thousand times fewer stars. Um, so this is going to be a, a, a revolution in terms of our understanding of the dynamical state of the Milky Way. Um, what, what's the rumor on uh, when is mid twenty sixteen for the? Yeah, so it'll probably be late summer, early fall. Um, it better be before late fall because there are like three different workshops that I know of on Giant <laughs> Data that are all scheduled starting in October. So if you'd like to know more about this, you can go to the website where the data release scenario is 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 laid out. Um, that's this website. Um, the first release that has proper motions in it for stars that they don't think are in binaries is going to be next year in 2017. Um, if you're interested, with the exception of stars that they've uh, co-solved with the Tycho catalog. And so that's a couple of million. And that's, but they're all pretty nearby, like be less than 12. So if you're interested in a disk, that's probably something you could do, but, but for the Halo, it's, it's not as interesting as the final, as the next year's release will be. So did you have a question or? Okay. Um, yeah, so if you want to know about any of these, I'm a, on one of the organizing committees for a working group within the, the Gaia Challenge team. So we're having our next workshop in early October in Stockholm. Uh, Gaia Sprints is an initiative by um, David Hogg and Adrian Price Whelan from New York who are gonna try to spur some early exercises with the, the Gaia catalog as it comes out um, and, and try to seed some collaborations between people that are interested in this. And the official workshop on the data release that's coming out this year is gonna be held at ESAC in November. So I would imagine that this is going to be later than whenever they release the catalog. <laughs> All right, so one of the cool things that you can do once you have 3D positions and 3D velocities is to study the streams not in, in sort of observer space, but in theory space. Um, and so one of, the, one of the ways that this can simplify things is by using what are called action angle variables, which you may remember from your classical mechanics class. I will remind you now what those are. So, so in, in normal space, we think of positions and their conjugate momenta as a pair, right? Um, and so angles and actions form a pair in the same way, and you can transform from one to the other by picking a coordinate system where the, motion, where the equations of motion of your, of your star are separable. And then in each coordinate, you integrate the momentum over an orbit, and that gives you an action. Um, and the nice thing about this is these are adiabatic invariants, so they're constants of the motion even if the potential is changing gradually over time. And the conjugate variables, the uh, angles, they just increase linear with, linearly with time proportional to the orbital frequency in each dimension. Um, and so what this does for you with streams is going to be illustrated in this movie, so you'll see a couple of these little blobs. And here, they'll be orbiting and disrupting in position space. This panel shows one of the angles and its conjugate action. And this panel shows two of the actions. And so you can see that while things get real complicated over here, this remains a relatively simple representation of the stream. Um, here's a different stream on a different orbit. You can see that it forms a little clump at a different location in action space, which tells you something about its orbit. Um, and here's a third. So you can see that if you throw in a bunch of satellite galaxies into a galactic potential, and you know what that potential is, and you transform to action space, you should expect to see a clumpy distribution like this. So here's, here's an example where I made up a mock stellar halo by doing this in a potential that I know. Um, and when I use the right potential, I can come back to this space to summarize all of the different building blocks that have gone into making this stellar halo. All right, so that, that's great, right? This provides a route to maybe untangle these things from each other, but you have to know the potential in order to do this. Um, so what does this have to do with measuring the Milky Way's mass? Uh, so it turns out that this is a bug, and, or this, this might seem like a bug, but it's actually a feature. Um, so, so you only get that result if you use the right potential. Here's one of the uh, actions in the potential that I used before. There are a few cases where you can write them down analytically instead of having to do these integrals. Um, and this is one of them. And so you'll see that the potential depends on the potential parameters, in this case, the total mass and the scale radius, and then on the observed positions and velocities through the angular momentum and the energy. Um, and if you use the right potential, then you'll get a clumpy distribution. 
But here what I've done is to fix the scale radius parameter at the right answer, but then scan through the mass and recompute the actions for all these wrong values of the mass. And you'll see that if you don't pick the right mass, you don't get a clumpy distribution, you get just a mess. So these are all the actions of all the stars from the mock halo. And when you get to the right answer, it's pretty obvious. So when this is supposed to be a, a, an actual simulation of the Milky Way. So it's a, it's a simulation where we chose uh, satellite galaxies to create streams that follow the luminosity distribution of the present day Milky Way satellites. And you get a mass twice as big as a previous graph that you showed. The, this is, she just made this. This model. is this is just a model where I picked the oh. mass. So it's not a real, not a real Milky Way. So I know what the real mass is because I just input it into the simulation. Um, and so, so what we what we can do is then choose uh, a way to measure statistically the the clumpiness of the action distribution for a trial potential, and then that's the figure of merit for the fit. Is how this works. So the thing that we use is called the relative entropy or callback lively divergence. So a little detour into information theory here, um, which compares the amount of information in a distribution P with a comparison distribution Q. So P in this case is the, the distribution of actions in the three different actions for all the stars in the sample for a guess at the Milky Way potential. And then we pick a distribution Q that to compare it to that's always guaranteed to be less clustered um, by shuffling the actions relative to one another. And so that keeps the range the same so that you can do the integral. Um, and then we use a kernel des density estimator to get the density as a, function of, uh, as a function of the actions for both of these and use that as the figure of merit for the fit. So just a quick example here. See here P is really clumpy, <coughs> and Q is not. And then you get something with a higher KLD. And then if P is not very clumpy relative to Q, you get a lower number. And it goes logarithmically as you can see here. Um, and so we use this as a way to measure the total amount of, of clumpiness in the potential. Um, and you'll notice that when I did this movie, I didn't put all of the colors corresponding to the different streams that are created on here like I did in this panel. And that's because you don't need that information in order to compute the statistical information content. Um, and so one of the advantages of doing this kind of analysis to, to fit a model to the Milky Way's mass distribution is that you don't need to pre-assign streams uh, stars to individual streams in order to do it. So you, the membership of a star in a given stream can actually be an output by running a, a structure finder on your output best fit action space. So what did you actually say about the template? Like what is the potential for? Oh, it, in this model, this is an isochrome potential because it's easy to compute the actions. But I'm about to show you an example where we fit an NFW model to some streams. In, in the information theory, higher number is better? Higher number is better, okay. yeah. And you can see that, like for a for a simple example, you don't actually get a very large like like linear change in the number, but it's a logarithmic measure. So you're actually it's like this is like the number of where is it extra bits per star that you get of information based on this. Depends yeah. on what you chose as your reference Q distribution. Yeah. So the details. So we we end up choosing this sort of shuffled distribution as our Q. Because it randomly reassign. Yeah, so we randomly reassign like like we have one column of the three actions right. and then you shuffle the next column and you shuffle the next column. And right. that particular choice turned out to work the best for a number of reasons that we figured out afterward. Um, that mostly boiled down to the fact that if you do the if you do that calculation for like a, a Gaussian, for example, what you get is proportional to like the, the correlation of the, of the multi-dimensional Gaussian, but not to the overall sigma. Okay. So, so you're sensitive more to like the, the way in which individual particles are associated into clumps than you are with the size of those clumps, which is kind of what you want, because the sizes will change a little bit as you change the mass of the, of the distribution. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit subtle why that is the best choice, but, but it also helps because you need to, to, to make the range the same so that the normalization doesn't kill you. Because um, you want these to have comparable normalizations because you're going to take a ratio. Um, and so that if you use something like a, an overall Gaussian, then it goes very small at, at, at the ends, and then you end up with that driving your calculation of the KLD. All right, so 
we did a lot of tests with mock halos that I'll show you later that were that were done using the halo I just showed you. But to convince you that this would work with a realistic example, I'll show you about this test first. Um, so we picked out from the tagged Aquarius simulation that I showed you at the beginning about 15 thin streams, uh, which are basically an ideal data set for this because you ideally you want a lot of non-overlapping clumps in action space to give you the most sensitivity. Because if they start to overlap, then you start to not be able to differentiate one from the other because you don't have membership information. Um, and so here's a picture of those on the sky, well, the sky with some arbitrary choice for where the sun is in the simulation. Um, and if you run this algorithm, this is the best fit action space you get um, for a smooth spherical NFW model as the potential model. So these streams were taken from a cosmological simulation. It's triaxial, it's not very NFW-like, and it's got lots of lumps in it of smaller substructures. So, so if it's going to fail for, for something that realistic by making this simple assumption, you'd expect it to fail now. Um, but we actually do a good job recovering the enclosed mass profile of the simulation. Um, so the, the black dashed line here is if you just bin up the dark matter in the simulation. Remember, there's no, no baryons in this, so we're all dark matter only, which is actually something that I'll get to later because that can change the internal structure of the potential. It'll add a disk, so then that makes things more complicated. Um, but anyhow, if you just bin up all the dark matter, you get the black dashed line, and the red line is our best fit. Um, and the error bars are this band, which looks a little large because I've projected the errors in each parameter, but they're, they're fairly degenerate along sort of a diagonal line. Um, if, you, if you sort of do a leave one out analysis, which isn't the right way to get the error bars, um, and take one stream out of the sample and then do the whole thing again, you get a spread that's a bit smaller than this, um, than this error bar. But the ranges that you get for the parameters are comparable to how we derive the error bars, which you can ask me about at the end if you want to really know. Um, and then these other, these other lines for comparison are just different NFW profiles normalized at different radii. So that's just to say that like this isn't a very good model for this potential because if you normalize this, like this blue one at the scale radius, you get a different profile than if you normalize at the virial radius like this green line does. Um, and so, so the fact that we normalize somewhere in the middle where our stars are on average um, helps get a better match. Um, so this down here shows sort of where the different star particles are that we're using. Um, and so you can see they go from fairly far out, uh, but they're mostly centered around like 40 kpc. Um, and so that's where you expect the best match because that's where you have the most data. And that indeed is what we find, is that outside that we get a really good match. So, so where is all this data going to come from? I told you about Gaia, right? So, so Basically, in the near term, Gaia is going to get proper motions to view of 20. Um, that, in a bright tracer like a K giant, will get you out to about 100 kpc. Um, later on, LSST and W first will, in parts of the sky, be able to go deeper and get and see farther out into the stellar halo and get proper motions there. Um, in the, as far as so, you need you need proper motions, you need positions, you need distances, and you need radial velocities. Right, it's a lot of information to do this. Um, the radial velocity sky is limited to about V of 16, so for a bright star that's like 20 kpc. Um, and then later on there are a bunch of um, multiplexed spectroscopic surveys that are planned both in the north and the south that are probably going to try and extend, at least for some tracers, extend the Gaia catalog RVs down to the limit of the Gaia survey. So that'll be great because that'll, like, that'll really get the reach of our understanding of the phase space structure out to about a third of the Milky Way's virial radius, which is really a, a huge advance beyond what we've got. Um, and I wanted to note that for our Lyrae particularly, this is cool, because for those, right, you can get a distance that's really accurate compared to a parallax distance or a photometric distance. Um, and so eventually, there's I've had some interesting conversations with people about what you can do once you have like LSST and W first in the, in the far future. Not so far. Um, but at the moment, we can sort of optimistically assume that you can even get 2% distances. And the distance turns out to be one of the primary sources of, of extra smearing when you convert into action space, because it, it comes into most of the phase-based coordinates when you're computing them from the observables. 
So if you take Gaia parallaxes for, for K giants, then here's a view of the action space of the initial mock halo that I showed you. Um, and then, and so this is what you would see in that mock halo if you use only Gaia data, so uh, only out to 20 kbc plus the parallaxes that you get from Gaia. Whereas if you have a, a proportional number of our lyra, you see much more structure because the distances are a lot better. Um, and so this argues for particularly going after these if you want to try to untangle different structures, um, depending on how many R lyra you can get per stream, which is actually not that many in most cases. Um, so in general, we find, like everybody else, that if you convolve a mock halo with error models for some of these different observational instruments, and then you try to do this again, um, it, the, the farther out you can go, the better handle you get, especially on the scale of the galaxy, right? Because you need information about stars orbiting at several scale radii in order to ideally constrain that parameter. So it's a lot harder to constrain than the enclosed mass of a given radius. Um, and so this plot has a number of different things that, that I tried, so I'll break it down a little bit for you. Um, so the solid symbols are the ones where I included the error, and the open symbols are the same set with the same assumptions, but with no errors. Um, and what I'm plotting is as a function of the average distance of the stars in a given sample, um, what the result was for the best fit scale radius, what the result is for the best fit total mass, and what the best result is, or what the fit result is for the enclosed mass at the mean distance of stars in the sample, which is where you have the most data, so that's where you should do the best. Um, you can see that you always do a good job measuring this enclosed mass, so the farther out you go, the closer your extrapolation is going to be for the total mass. And, and likewise, you need, in this case, the scale radius is like 8 kpc, so you need a couple of times the scale radius as your average distance or as the range of distances in order to really get a good handle on that parameter. Um, so, so just a couple of highlights. The peak guys are the R Lyrae, which are always bang on because their distance errors are so good, but which for which there are so few tracers that you get a huge error bar because you have a hard time reconstructing the density using the kernel estimator because you don't sample the action space. Um, all of these other points are for K giants. Um, and the ones that say only are just using RVs uh, from Gaia without assuming any follow-up um, and using their error models for the, the proper motions and everything. Um, and those are mostly clustered at smaller distances because, like I said, Gaia doesn't get RVs out to the edge of their catalog. But then if you add, um, and then the different choices are just different like degrees of stringency on the selection for the transverse velocity error. So as you get more strict, you end up with a better result. Um, and then these plus ones like these guys um, are when you add in extra RVs out to the edge of the Gaia survey um, from, from ground-based spectroscopic follow. So you can see that more data just gives you a better job and going to farther distances helps you do a better job, which are not that surprising, but it's true for this this situation as well. So Gaia, like, uh, the, in terms of 20th magnitude yeah. proper motion, it's not very good. The proper motions are very good. So, but, so that, just, that would seem to be that gets involved in yeah, it does. You, you still win because you get more? You still win if you go farther. Um, okay. because, because the because pro and in fact the distance error is is worse is more problematic at large distances than the proper motion error because the trans the, the tangential velocity is, is distance times proper motion essentially. Yeah. So and so the distance error is sort of max out at twenty percent because you presume that you can get the photometric distance to that level, even if Gaia sucks at your parallax. Okay. Um, but that still, that's still worse than having the Gaia proper motions of those distances. Okay. Where it comes in a little bit with the distance errors also is, is that you get a sort of let's call for bias effect, and that's why the mass is always overestimated, not underestimated. Um, but yeah, so, so for, for, Purposes of Gaia, yeah, that's true. Once you get out to like where the R lyrate are, then the proper motion error dominates. Like because they have good enough distances that you don't need to that you don't need to worry about them anymore compared to that. Um, but for a generic star, you're you're sort of working here, competing even at the edge of. Gaia. 
All right, so the last thing that I'll remark about this topic, and then I'll, I'll probably skip the last section because I'm running over time, um, is that if you have other information, you can add extra dimensions and improve the fit that way as well. And so the other information that I have been looking at recently is if you have different abundances um, that to assign all your stars as well as their dynamical, um, as well as their positions and velocities. So, so the positions and velocities you expect to be correlated for stuff that all came from the same stream because it all came from the same progenitor. Um, additionally, you expect that, a, that different satellite galaxies have had, with different masses, have had different star formation histories and therefore a different uh, abundance distribution in various chemical abundances. Um, and furthermore, although you could have two satellite galaxies that had similar masses and maybe similar star formation histories, you don't expect them to also be on the same orbit. So there's extra information in abundance space that should help you assign stars to streams and, and give you extra dimensions of labels in which to compute the KLD. Um, and so I did some tests recently. I've been working with the, the Latte simulation series, which is from the fire team at Caltech. Um, and here's a view in sort of uh, four bands action space. This is the Z angular momentum versus energy. Um, and I've colored the stars by their metallicity, um, or the star particles by their metallicity. And you can see that there's some clustering in, in constants of motion, and then also like different clusters sometimes have slightly different um, colors, and therefore metallicity. So there's some information here. Um, and my, my initial tests show that this should probably help improve the fit in the following way. So if you just have the actions, and you compute what the KLD between the action distribution and the, and the shuffled version is for the correct potential, which is this green, then you get this green line here. As you add extra dimensions of abundance information, that goes up. So the peak of the, of the figure of merit goes up. But you're adding extra dimensions to KLD, which fundamentally increases the amount of um, increases its value at some level. So you can compare this not to zero, but to the sort of minimum over the parameter space that you explore for the potential. And, and that sort of gives you a baseline for just how much it, you gain by adding an extra dimension even if there's no additional information. And so that's this red line. And so the point is that as you increase the number of different abundances that you add, the gap between the, the low part of your parameter, of your, of your likelihood, not likelihood, but the low part of your figure of merit and the high part gets larger. So this makes the peak of your best fit um, in parameter space higher above the background in principle. So I'm, I'm doing some more tests with this now, but it seems like it depends a little bit on, on which elements you add, which has to do with the yield table and the simulation mostly. Um, but you should, in principle, if you have this kind of information, not only be able to improve your constraints on the potential, but also help untangle different structures from one another by looking at higher dimensions where things are more separated. So that's the takeaway from here. Um, and you can see like this is, this is one way to do it. There are many ways in which people are gonna try to constrain the potential with tidal streams. Um, once we have Gaia data, this is clearly not the only way to go, but I think uh, from the perspective of being able to put in a sample that's blind to the membership of stars and streams, this is a good approach because it simultaneously takes information from many tidal streams and, and gives a consensus model uh, for all of the different orbit families that are explored by those streams. Um, so these, and, and the, as I showed you in, in the cases where we can involved with Gaia error models, not all of the clumpiness goes away when you include realistic observational errors. So this is something that's within reach in the next couple of years. Um, you, you get the right parameters with some bias if you don't have enough distance range. Um, and you have enough streams in the Milky Way, or at least we expect there to be, in order to do this. In practice, it looks like you need about 10 or 20 to fit a simple um, spherical model, but I don't expect that number to go up a lot as you add parameters, just because as you add parameters, you also get more power in action space because more of the actions vary as you change the potential. In a, in a spherical potential, only the radial action is, is sensitive, so the other two are just labels. Um, but in a triaxial potential, for example, as you change the potential shape and, and mass distribution, all three actions will change, so you have more constraining power for less symmetry, which is nice. Um, 
And finally, uh, if you if you do it this way, then you and you run on the output of structure finder, you can help point people towards which streams should have which stars in them, rather than having that be an input, which is a, is a useful thing uh, because I think since you're throwing away a lot of potential sources of information here by just using three of the six phase space coordinates and by discarding any p potential information about membership that you have, you can get more accurate constraints on the Milky Way's potential by folding in that information in the end, but you need to know the membership in order to do that. So I think this, this is one pathway towards helping to achieve a really realistic close-up model of the Milky Way's past history. All right. So I'm going to stop there, and you can ask me about that later. <laughs> Let me just put up my last slide. Cool. There. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Any further questions? Oh, have you had, have you had a chance at all to try, try this on the Milky Way itself with the data you have? The proper motion measurements there are just it's, not good enough. Just not good enough at all. Yeah, know. so like there, there's a there's a US and OB sort yeah. cross match, but the, the proper motion errors there are like four milliarc seconds or something. It's yeah, okay. So it's really not good enough. I, I thought about it, but it's just not. I was just curious if you tried it all, what constraints you actually get. Because there does seem to be this argument, at least about what the mass of the Milky Way is. Yeah. So, you know, so, so the problem with, with using really really bad proper motions yeah. is that the the one failure mode that is most intractable for this fit is that if you if you can't if the if the density estimator can't really see the individual peaks corresponding with the different structures, if it blurs them all together, then it decides that the best way to increase the clustering is to just jam everything down into the center of a really massive oh, potential. Got it. <laughs> and so you end up not getting any constraint at all that way because you can't see the individual clusters in the okay. action space. Um, and so you need to have some minimal amount. Even with Gaia, that tends to be a problem and you have to sort of push so there has to be enough contrast. back away. So there has to be enough contrast yeah. to be able to see the individual streams within the data set. And this is the same this is the same reason why you have to remove successfully like the thick disk, for example, um, from the sample very effectively. And maybe even Sagittarius too, because every star contributes linearly to the fit. And so if you have one structure that takes up most of the stars, then you're just going to have the same problem. Okay. So you have to, that's why I said that like many small things is the optimal data set because they don't overlap. They're all equally sort of contributing, pulling on the fit. Yeah. Um, that would be the optimized thing to do. Um, if, you, if you had all your membership information and could right. pull it all out, right? But since we don't do that, you have to think about how to keep the contrast high enough to get a good result. I just have a follow-up question uh, before, before I turn the floor. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> really not, it looks like it wasn't that sensitive depending on what profile you put into it. Was that FW versus a real, uh, you know, the Aquarius more consistent with like an Anasto profile or something? So, so Aquarius A, which is when we did the test yeah. on, is the, the sub-halo is sure, they're better fit by Anastos. The, right, right. the overall halo, I think, is in that case, is an Anasto with a pretty different profile from the NFW. Right. Um, Even at these radii, I just can't remember. Yeah. Okay. Plus, it's, it gets pretty triaxial towards the outskirts. Yeah. So, so it was nice that the spherically average mass distribution, you're still yes. doing it right when you make all of these quantized assumptions. So it's not we actually great. did a lot better than I expected. Yeah, I agree. I would have wondered if that would have contributed more if you're yeah, so I think part of the error bar is from the difference between like the mass profiles if you look on the different in, in yeah. different directions. So that's contributing to to the uncertainty. Or if it's unspherical. Yeah. 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 So I have two questions. First one is that you mentioned like saying adding data, adding my lessons to the energy computer. But because Casey asked this, so I was just wondering. When you say that it can improve, but if it's have large uncertainty at, at that, it won't help much. So yeah. that you, when you add in, for example, the, the problem motion, you, you want the problem to be better than a certain kind of yeah. central. But I assume also there's some kind of number from uncertainty. Because else you can do pedometry in unless you're using U, G, R, N. So yeah. I'm not sure if that's good enough, or you need actual spectroscopy. Yeah, so what I found, 
so far, which is still, I'm still working on it, is that if you just add like a generic metallicity, it doesn't help you all that much because like most dwarf galaxies have like, the same spread of metallicities. You really need at least two different abundances. Um, but then I think you probably need something on the order of like 0.1 dex or 0.05 dex is going to be enough because the each each building block has sort of a span of, of things. It's not like chemical tagging in the disk where you need to very accurately measure the, the abundances. Having more dimensions helps you more than having more accurate abundances. Does. So when you show all those previous results, it's assuming perfect, like a zero error. So I haven't done I haven't shown any results that have the metallicities in them oh, no, other than the, other than the, the one plot. And yeah. there I assume perfect data. Okay. Um, but even for kinematics it's also perfect. Yeah, for kinematics it's also perfect. But um, but yeah, so like I'm in the process of doing all of this again with the added dimensions and with some reasonable observational errors. But I think the the way to go from an observational standpoint is to get more different abundances that are sort of perpendicular to one another in the sense of where they come from, like how they're produced, right? So, so like ideally you'd have at least an alpha abundance and a metallicity and that would help uh, more than just one of those two, um, is what I'm thinking. Okay. But quantitatively I have yet to, to I, I can't make a strong <coughs> statement on that as of right now. Uh, you talk about shells, the So I think the problem there is the distances, um, because the these shell structures are are not very thick. They're like a kiloparsec thick, and and if you want to find one in the Milky Way, you have to have distances good to a kiloparsec at you know tens to 100 kpc, and you need to have them over a large portion of the sky because a shell. If you're looking up from within the galaxy, it looks like you're looking up at an umbrella, right? It's going to be over, spread over a large piece of sky. So you need some way to get out of a out of a sky survey distances that are good to a kiloparsec over 100. Um, and as far as I know, nobody's done that yet. But I think it's not out of the question to try to look for that in some tracer like RLI, right, where you can get the distances very well. Um, actually, I was looking at in like for instance. If you, it, with, within the, the planned high latitude survey footprint for W first, if you, if you see enough RLRI in one structure, um, you could then sort of unambiguously say that it was a shell because you'd have good enough distances and then you go back and follow up on all the RLRI with radial velocities. And in that case, you actually are looking basically at the, the 3D radius and the radial velocity in the frame of the galaxy because it, that, those distances, it's a, almost the same as the heliocentric line of sight velocity and distance. So, so if you can see these tracers to, to that kind of distance resolution, then I think it's possible. But, but it's challenging for like an, an entirely different set of reasons than for extragalactic, because you're sort of looking at something that is over so much sky and is so thin. Can you do it for Andromeda? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Everybody wants to know this. I stayed away from that system because you have so much resolved star stuff there that, that, that there you can do more advanced and body modeling with it. And, uh, okay. and so I, I had I'd stayed away from it. But I'm kind of thinking now about going back and seeing if I can get some data and do it uh, as, like a, as like a validation case. Right, exactly. Um, yes. Because it, they actually have much more constraining information there because you know the the and so like Mark Fardala has had a series of papers on this um, where they've they've come up with like a good model and they connected originally the, the long tail to these two shells in Andromeda as parts of the same encounter. Um, the other difficulty in Andromeda is that the brighter of the two shells is actually at a really awkward alignment angle. Like it's kind of pointed almost either almost toward us or almost away from us. Um, and so since you're not really, yeah, you really kind of want it to be like edge edge on so that you can get a good dot product. And the farther away from that you get, the more sensitive you are to the angular momentum that you don't know. Um, so, so that's the other reason. The fainter of the two shells that they associate with that system is in a more optimal alignment. You can do a better job there. But, but the other thing is that 
the tail of that system, because you see this material that's still falling back in from the tidal disruption, that has a huge handle that the analytic models that I have made don't, doesn't take into account at all, right? And so the velocity gradient along that, uh, which there was just a paper on the archive about like a couple weeks ago that they went back and, and made better measurements of it, that has a huge handle for the shape and the, and the mass profile um, because it's this long stream of particles on a radial orbit. Um, and so that's why I've stayed away from that system particularly. And when I do tests, I actually reproject the whole thing into a more optimal alignment. <laughs> Because when you when you look at especially the one shell in the, the alignment that it's in, it, it becomes difficult to account for the angular momentum properly when you do the, the modeling. Well, it could take some, some some case where you know it and you yeah. know, and just tilt it back and you think. Yeah, that's like true. Uh, yeah. Another questions? So actually, goal point three was really interesting. Can you give like a two sentence summary of, of, of that and then just the people Yeah. Like, yeah, so so the, the deal with this is that, um, so this is interesting because we think that in cold dark matter you should have subhalos without any stars in them once you get down below some threshold size where you can't hold up the gas through minimization. Uh, but nobody's ever really gotten good evidence for this. And one of the ways people think they can detect it is if, if one of these crashes through a tidal stream and opens up sort of a gap in the stars by scattering a couple of them um, or, or moving them a little bit on their orbit so that gradually the gap opens up over time or where their orbits would have been. Um, so there's been a ton of work on this. All right, there's been a ton of work on this. All these people have written papers on the theory. You can see that as you use different sized subhalos in the evolution of your stream, you get different effects on the, on the stream. So people have also argued that this is a way to get a handle on the mass function of subhalos at the small scale, which would be great if we could do it, right? And you, and in fact, if you take a stream and you involve it in a lumpy potential, it it looks a little bit ratty. <laughs> so here's an example. So we, we were looking for how often this happens in Aquarius, um, just to get an idea self-consistently, because most of the studies before have either focused on the dynamics of the stream after the during and after the interaction, or have done evolutions where they, they by hand insert tidal streams resembling globular cluster tidal streams, and then see what happens with that. But we wanted to see what happens if you took the tagged, the, the streams that come from the disruption of satellite galaxies, and and how often the subhalos from that same simulation, which is cosmological, end up interfering with those streams to sort of get a more self-consistent handle on this problem. So we use the Aquarius tags for this. Um, and here's a snapshot of one of the streams with the tagged particles, and then all the stuff with the, like two, two or five kpc of it. Um, I think two. Um, and so all of these different subhalos are close by at, in this snapshot. So these interactions are happening like all the time, but they're all fairly weak. So this S parameter sort of measures like how how big of a velocity kick the subhalo could give a star in the stream relative to uh, its total orbital energy. And you can see that most of them have very small ratios, so they can't move the individual stars by that much. So, so the, the, the view from the Aquarius simulation seems to be you get a lot of weak interactions um, with occasional stronger ones. It can still produce changes in the structure of the stream, but they're, they're not as clear cut as a lot of the, the views that people have been using with globular clusters. Part of that is because we have much lower resolution in the stream. They can just take you know 100,000 particles and put them in their stream, but we have to work with what the thing gives us. Um, and you can generate these sort of encounter histories in terms of like time since this red line, which is formation. Um, and you can sort of look at the range of velocities that you get for these interactions and see you know what has the potential to to make significant changes in the stream. Um, and you get a really broad range of interactions because you're kind of probing the overall stream. Um, and so we have some preliminary numbers for this, um, but they're limited a lot by the like, time resolution of the snapshots in the simulation. Um, so they're kind of an underestimate. But basically, you expect that like within 10 giga years, if you have a stream that's now 10 kpc long, you'll get order 5 to 10 within subhalos that come within a few kiloparsecs of the stream over that time. 
Um, so, so a, a generic thin stream at the present day will still have had some encounters. So it's, it's not that many, but it's enough to, to maybe work with. Um, so there's, there's what I was going to say about that. Oh, okay. it's longer than two sentences. Uh, uh, two, uh, two sentences <laughs> on, on biblical time scales. Yeah. Um, so, uh, all right. So, okay. So let's uh, thank Robin again. And uh, so it's time for lunch. And uh, so, she, like I said, she'll be around uh, through Wednesday. So if you want to chat with her, she'll be sitting on the fourth floor of the office.